Revelation 19, beginning with verse 1. I wasn't here last Wednesday, and uh, uh, Dad's not feeling well tonight, and uh, I didn't want to jump ahead on where he's at, so we'll touch base on some of the things discussed last week. After and after these things. Pertains to specifically chapter 18, but also the entire book of Revelation in a broader sense. I heard a great voice of much people in heaven. Proclaims praise, which is the exact opposite of what is happening on earth. Saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. The song here, and it is a song, does not begin with ascribing salvation to God, as the English version suggests. It rather affirms the fact The salvation is God's. It is the echo of the ancient utterance, salvation belongs unto God. For true and righteous are his judgments. Neither men nor spirit beings in all honesty can fault God for what he has done regarding the system of this world. For he has judged the great harlot, pertains to every false way of salvation, irrespective of what it might be. No matter how beautiful it might look outwardly, the Lord refers to it as the great harlot. Which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. This refers to all the religions of the world and for all time. However, it also refers to the fact that if the preacher is not preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified as the answer to man's dilemma, then in some manner he is preaching and projecting a type of spiritual fornication and has avenged the blood of the servants at her hand almost all of the persecution against the true saints of god in this world and for all time has come from apostate religion and it started with cain and again they said alleluia this praise of the lord is because of the destruction of the literal city of babylon The Alleluia in verse 1 was proclaimed concerning the destruction of mystery Babylon. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. Proclaims the fact that her judgment is eternal. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we go over these verses, we, we ask for your anointing and we ask for your presence. Let us leave here tonight saying and knowing that we have been in the presence of the Lord And we give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen. This chapter, this 19th chapter, leading up to verse 11, which is the second coming, is obvious, deals with the subject of praise that is going on in heaven. Uh, I'm going to ask some questions of the panel. I don't mean to put y'all on the spot, but uh, I am going to put you on the spot. So I hope you know your stuff. Uh, This is happening in heaven, correct? This is going on. So the first thing we want to identify is who are these people that are praising the Lord at this moment? Lauren, I'll start with you. Well, um, you've got the four and 20 elders um, that are listed. Uh, We also have... uh, I think those are the people that we see listed. We didn't read it. It's in verse 4. And they are representatives of all the people, saved people, uh, that have existed for all time. Uh, The four beasts uh, are said to be around the throne. I think we see them in Revelation 4, declaring the glory of God over and over, declaring what Robin's saying tonight, Holy, holy, holy. Uh, and it's a, it's a nonstop worship uh, scene. The four and 20 elders is sometimes referred to as uh, just 24 people, but I've always believed that they were a, uh, a conglomerate of people that actually changed shifts, like the priests in the table, temple mm-hmm. of, uh, that David set up. Yeah, we discussed that one yeah. time a few minutes I think ago. that there's really, because the, one of the promises of God to the overcomer is, you will sit with me in my throne, which is a unique place. And if that's true, then at one point in time, if the body of Christ takes shifts, 
in this capacity, uh, then each and every one of us will at one time be there. Well, I don't know that that well, can be said, substantiated. But well, he said in verse 1, I heard a great voice as of much people. Right. So I think that we can ascertain from that that these are the saints that have lived from the beginning. I would go all the way back to Abel and all the way up to all the saints that are in heaven up to that time. Certainly, yeah. Uh, that's what we find surrounding the throne. The 24 elders will be specific people out of that group. And um, we know that we're looking at a worship scene, like you said, that extends all the way to the marriage supper of the Lamb and just prior to the return of the Lord to the earth. So it's a, it's a, it's a powerful, powerful scene. What, what is praise, Dave? Recognition of who God is and praising him, giving him honor, respect, all for who he is, what he's done. Well, wouldn't you say that would be more of a definition of worship? Worship is acknowledging God for who he is and praise is acknowledging God for what he has done. Okay. I think that's a distinction for that. The distinction between praise, if you want to know the difference, praise is the acknowledgement of what God has done. Yeah. We acknowledge all of his mighty acts, all of his works that he has done, creation, all of his miracles, uh, everything that he's done, our salvation, the price paid for that salvation, what he had to endure of stepping out of eternity into time and taking upon himself a, a lesser nature, the nature of man, and then becoming the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. But worship goes into acknowledgement of just who God is. Right. We worship God not because of what he can do or what he has done, but because he is God. Right. But here's one thing I also think we need to understand regarding praise. This is something that we need to do constantly. Every day, all day, as much as we can. And we've said it last week, we've said it many times, that it doesn't have to be an audible thing. It can be within our spirit. But as a child of God, the greatest praise that we can offer is the fact that God saved us from a life of sin. And that, as I like to say, we all like to say it, we're no longer on our way to hell. Yeah, we're on our way to heaven. And as a result of that, our praise, that, that should be coming from our heart consistently, daily. And it shouldn't, I mean, praise should be ever on our lips. Well, to, to prove that point, let's look at the word alleluia and its meaning. Alleluia is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word hallelujah. And it, and it's, 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 it, it means praise the Lord. So every time you see hallelujah or alleluia, especially in the Psalms, it, it, it's, it's an added explanation of praising the Lord. And the whole idea is, is that if praise is going to be to the, to the degree that it is in heaven, if it's going to be loud, if it's going to be in unison, if it's going to be a constant ongoing thing, why should we wait till we get to heaven to praise the Lord? I want to make a statement. Give the Lord a hand clap for that. Oh, you can do better than that. If you're going to clap, clap right. Um, I want to make a statement, and I've said this on Mother's Program when people call in. You can praise your way out of depression. Now, understand that. Depression or oppression, whatever terminology you want to use, is when Satan turns everything inward and you're focusing on you. But praise is the adoration and the acknowledgement of somebody that's not you. The focus becomes on the Lord, who he is, what he's done in, in your life. And as we begin to praise him, that takes the light, if you will, off of our problems and, and I told someone the other day, they were talking about how depressed they were. And they were going, it was bad. But I looked at them and I told them, your victory is not in somebody laying hands on you. 
Your victory is not in somebody praying for you, but your victory is in your mouth. And I said, start praising the Lord. Well, I don't know what to praise for. Yes, you do. If you, if all you can remember is what Gabriel said, I'm on my way to heaven. Right. I'm not lost. I'm a child of God. No matter what goes on in this life, soon and very soon, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. If you, if that's all you, look, that's enough right there. And if you just keep praising the Lord over your salvation, you can literally praise your way out of the valley of the shadow of death and praise your way to the mountaintop of victory. I believe that. What another way of uh, looking at praise is an act of faith. Absolutely. It, it's so easy to focus our eyes on ourselves or our circumstances. And when we praise God, we take our eyes off of self, off of our circumstances, and put them on Him. Not just our physical eyes, but our spiritual eyes. Right. And you're tapping into a truth that faith expressed always brings the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. As you express faith in God, as Donnie said a moment ago, who he is and what he's done, then that expression of faith is always um, reciprocated by grace. The old saints used to say, as the praises go up, the blessings come down. In In a measure and in a way, the grace of God is the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. If you want to come out of that depression, and you begin to express praise towards the Lord, you're ending into a uh, a cycle of spiritual truth that never fails. Faith expressed will always bring the grace of God. It's sowing and reaping. Yeah, Yeah, I I wanted to share uh, Hebrews 13, 15. By him, referring to Christ, the previous verse talks about Jesus sanctifying the people by his own blood. So by him, therefore, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise. There's times in which you just don't feel like doing it. You're talking about it. We should do it on a regular basis. Brother Donnie, you're talking about in the midst of your trials and tribulations and your depression, your oppression, your attacks, that you don't feel like it, but you do the sacrifice of praise uh, to God. And it says continually, continually. So by him, therefore, let us offer up the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips. So in other words, it's vocal. It's not just uh, 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 our, in our mind. We should also say it out loud, giving thanks to his name. There's just, there's something about the name of Christ, isn't it? We sing a song here quite often. Put on the garment of praise for the The spirit spirit of of heaviness. heaviness. And there has been so many people, and I know it. The moment we start singing it, you can almost feel heaviness leaving the building because that granted we all face things we all struggle with things we are all going through situations and circumstances and sometimes we just need to praise the lord to thank him for what he's done for us and that by faith he's going to see us through this valley so that's why we say you put on that garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness because god's going to see you through whatever stronghold whatever struggle you're facing well, see, that, that song was actually taken from, from the song. Isaiah 61. Mm-hmm. Well, when we read Isaiah 61, if you go back starting with verse 1, he tells us, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim at liberty to the captives and to open the prison doors. But then in verse 3, he tells us to anoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, Mm -hmm. the oil of joy for mourning, to put on the the garment of praise for the spirit spirit of heaviness. Now, you were talking about hallelujah. Here in chapter 19... We find that term hallelujah used four times between verse 1 and verse 6. It's not found in the rest of the New Testament. No. Only here. Mm -hmm. And I believe that those who are crying out to God are not only the saints that are in heaven. 
Because we know when Jesus came out of the grave, all of the saints came out with him. We know in, in according to what Matthew mm-hmm. chapter 27, I believe it's around verse 57 tells us. But we also know that if you go back to Revelation chapter 6, you have the fifth seal that is broken in verse 9. And it talks about all of those that were under the altar mm-hmm. crying out to God. I think that worship of God is a conglomerate of all of those crying out to God for his judgment has finally come on the enemy. Well, Revelation 5, 12, the statement we all know, worthy is the lamb. That's the key part. Okay, because the lamb is worthy, what is he worthy of? Our praise. Yes. Our glory. Our adoration. Our acknowledgement. You know, I try to make it a point uh, every morning when I'm out walking, and I pray for most of the way. That's when I use my time to pray. And, and I, don't, I don't believe in trying to memorize certain words to say it needs to come from the heart. But I find myself over and over saying, and, and I don't really pray out loud, but in my spirit I'm praying. Now, sometimes I'm praying out loud, but, of course, if somebody drove up, I don't want them to think I'm crazy. I really don't care. But I, I, I just say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to come to you right now. And I'm not asking you for anything. I just want to worship you, and I just want to praise you. I just, let me thank you for everything that you've done. I, and, I, I, and I just start going through things, and it's just, just different every day. Uh, you know, I might say, you know, Lord, I thank you. I, for the privilege of I got two legs to be out here at 4.30 in the morning walking, and I'm in my right mind, and I can do this. I want to praise you for my health, and I'm going to praise you for being— I, I, Yesterday morning, I started, Lord, I thank you. I'm an American. Lord, I thank you. I could have been born— and I, this is serious. Lord, I could have been born any other place in the world, but you allowed me— to be born in the greatest nation in the world, a nation of freedom and democracy. And then I went in and, Lord, not only would you give me the privilege or allow me to be born in this nation, but, Lord, you allowed me to be born in a home that was saved, my, a mother and father that are born again, that were spirit-filled. Lord, I thank you. I, I've just been going, Lord, I thank you as a child. I, I can remember my mom and dad worshiping you and praising you and glorifying you. Lord, I just thank you that I can remember seeing this person saved and sick bodies healed and revivals, hearing dad preach and seeing people's bondages broken. Lord, what a life I've had. If, 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 if if it all ended today, how great a life have I had? And it's just let the Lord, just begin to praise Him. And the more you begin to praise Him, the easier it becomes. Because you can't complain when you praise. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, and you can't doubt when you praise well, either. <laughs> where there is true praise, there is always true faith. That's it. Where there is true faith, there will always be praise. Faith and praise can not be separated. It's, it's, it's like a, I remember the, uh, an, a dear, I was in an African American, I was in a, a, a church, it used to be Kojic, Church of God in Christ. And you've never been to church until you go to a Church of God in Christ church, especially one with about 3,000 African Americans. The only problem is they don't know how to tell time. The clock does not exist. And, but anyway, I remember, I, I remember watching, it was in, in Washington, I mean, they were praising the Lord, people were worshiping, and they started dancing. And I, I, and I remember one of the dear old precious saints, she, she had to be 70 or 80 years old, and she wasn't talking to anybody but the Lord and to the devil. And she, every time I pick up my foot, I'm saying glory to God. 
Every time I put my foot down, I'm saying, devil, you're defeated. Every time I pick my foot up, I'm saying, greater is he that is in me than he. And every time I put my foot down, devil, you're defeated. Devil, you're God. And I'm just like, yeah, that's it. Yeah. We got a lot to learn here. He said, hallelujah. Now, there's four key words in this first verse that I want to look at before we close. He said, salvation, glory, honor, and power. That word salvation tells us that salvation belongs to God. Man has nothing to do with their salvation except an expression of faith. That's it. But we cannot create salvation. That's of God and God alone. Then he said, glory. That word glory in in the Greek, it means beauty. It means grandeur. It means dignity. It means royalty. So when we say glory, we're acknowledging all of these beautiful, wonderful attributes of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is beauty beyond compare. His grandeur of his glory, his majesty, and his dignity, and his royalty. You know, we, the closest we can come to it is sometimes in Europe where they still have kings. And, you know, I'm not really too, too being an American, I'm not really too keen. I'm, I, I, it wouldn't do any good for me to meet the king of England because I would not bow. I'm not going to bow to a person. I'm just not going to do that. But, and I don't mean any disrespect, that's their custom, but I'm not going to do that. But if you ever go to London and you witness with your eyes all of the pomp and the majesty with the changing of the guard, I mean, it gets you because you realize all of the history behind everything that they're doing. And you realize that from all of that pomp and circumstance would arise the Magna Carta. And then you realize the Magna Carta served as the foundation of the Declaration of Independence and our democracy here. But there's a pomp and there's a circumstance to it. And it'll get you for a moment. But that pales in comparison to the glory and the beauty and the royalty that we will observe and see in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I mean, it's beauty that we cannot, we've never beheld. We can't describe it. It is grandeur beyond, we don't have imagination to come up with it. It is dignity and holiness that we cannot describe. And it is royalty beyond anything the royals in Europe can come up with. Then he said honor. That word honor means, um, it means precious. That which is of great value. That which is of great price. When we look at Christ, his very life symbolizes the price that was paid. That's why we say worthy is the lamb. Then that word power, it, it's, from, it's the Greek word dunamis that we read in Acts 2. And you shall receive power. It means miraculous power. It means miracle working power. It means ability beyond the norm. It means strength. And the, I love this final uh, uh, definition in, found in this word power. It means the ability to do anything. Now, it's not speaking of us. It's speaking of the Lord. He has the power to do anything. Now, do you realize, do you believe that tonight? He has the power to heal you. He has the power to put gas in your car. He has the power to put clothes on your back. He has the power to put food on your table. He has the power to heal your sick body. He has the power to save your wayward children. He has the power to make the crooked path straight. There's nothing too hard for him. That's right. So he deserves the praise. Yes. He's, he's omnipotent. 
He's omnipotent. One of my favorite attributes of God is his omnipotence, all-powerful. And he's all, uh, he's omniscient, he's everywhere, and he's omnipotent. The, the devil's not omnipotent. He, no. He has limited power, but God has all power. And he's not omniscient? And he's not omniscient, and he's not... Uh, all-knowing? All-knowing. He's not immutable. He's not eternal. He was a created being, but... Uh, but God is, is all-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere at once. The devil is not all-knowing. However, understand this. He knows enough because you tell him. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Some of you are just staring at me like, what are you talking about? You tell him you're sick. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Every time you say, I'm depressed, you're telling him your state of mind. If you didn't walk around complaining, he wouldn't know it. Hello? I I remember, uh, we had a close singer, and an old time, uh, uh, it wasn't Brother Trotter, I don't remember who it was, but I remember them, somebody coming up to them, I was a little boy, I heard him, they said, what are you going to preach tonight? He goes, I'm not telling you. Not until, he said, why? He goes, I don't want the devil to know. (laughs) Until I start preaching it. And, and I never could figure out what he meant until I, until I realized he didn't, want the, he didn't want the battle to start. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. And I, and I kind of do that now. Somebody came up to me at the, camp, at the conference and said, what are you preaching on tonight? And I said, you got to be there. Mm-hmm. Not telling you. Because, the, because talking about all of our problems and issues, that's the opposite of praise. And that's what too many people do. They, they spend all their time talking about all the the terrible things going on in their life instead of giving praise and honor and glory to God. There's an old hymn that we used to sing, count your blessings and name them one by one, and look what God has done. And it, it'll get you encouraged when you start thinking about all the things God has done. Uh, on that note, as we close, when, when, even when I'm in, and I've, the, the, I've learned this in the last 30 years, through trials and tribulations. The Lord knows what I'm going through. And in prayer, I'm not going to take time to walk through every single problem. He knows what I'm going through. And I've learned, and I don't want the devil to give the devil glory. And I've learned to say, Lord, you know what I'm facing. I don't have to enunciate it. You know what it is. And I don't have to articulate it. You know what it is. And not only do you know what it is, you know how to handle it. So, and then the last thing I'm going to say, this worship and praise has to do with the destruction of Babylon. And it's really the destruction of Satan. So when we praise the Lord, understand we're also not only praising the Lord, the ultimate praise is we're praising Him that in the end, He wins. And His victory is our victory. Stand to your feet tonight. Amen. Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Lord, we pray that something has been said tonight that will help your people. That's all we want to do is to give your people something that they can grow on, that they can help them mature, that can help them in their time of trial and tribulation. Lord, we bring tomorrow and Friday before you. We're asking, O oh Lord, that the Spirit of God would move across the hearts of the viewing audience of SBN. And I'm Lord, I'm asking you to especially move upon those that are faithful viewers, but they have never supported SBN before. They watch with regularity, but they've never once called. They've never once gone online. They've never once pulled out an envelope and sent a check in the mail. And Lord, we're thankful for all of our audience, whether they give or not. But Lord, we know that that's not right. We know that if we are deriving strength and sustenance from something, that we have a responsibility to support that.
And I'm asking especially that your spirit would move on those that are watchers, but they have not yet supported. And Lord, as they step out in faith to give, I'm asking for the blessing of God that you promised in your word would begin to work in their life, not next year, but now, now to bring blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Shake off those heavy bands. Praise the Lord. you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call one 800 288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.